And guess what? Canada is the single largest supplier of oil and gas to the U.S. Um, most of that is coming down, down here. Pipelines either existing or, or slated to go all through the country um, for us to get this oil so you can pump it into your gas tank and uh, fly around the country on it. That's what it's going to be for. On the wintering grounds where these birds often spend time in, in intertidal areas and in, in mangroves, dowagers in the, in the southeast, uh, in, the, in the Caribbean and, and Central America, of course, many of you again know the story of the massive destruction of, of mangrove habitats for things like shrimp farming. And, you know, again, how many people think you go into the store around here and you can get a package of those frozen shrimp? Comes from Mexico, um, comes from this kind of, this kind of um, destructive farming. Um, and then all the other birds, you know, that are uh, in many cases uh, endemic birds just found in, in mangrove habitats in the same places where these birds win winter. I always love to throw this one on. It's not energy. But, um, um, you know, how many people think about where your Kleenex come from, your paper towels? You know, how many, how many people rip off a paper towel, a bounty towel, to wipe up a, a mess on the counter while they're looking at, at a white-throated sparrow in the backyard that is being, you know, sort of that, that bird being imperiled by, by the millions of acres lost of, of, in this case, virgin boreal forest that's cut, uh, never before touched forest, cut to make throwaway products like Kleenex, tissue paper, um, and, and um, catalogs. This, um, and just an, one example, uh, Victoria's Secret, um, the company that owns Victoria's Secret, they send out a million catalogs a day. They're one of the biggest users of this forest. Most of that until this past year was actually used for, um, was, was actually boreal forest um, uh, that was cut to make these catalogs, to make a million catalogs a day to send out so we can throw them in the recycle bin and most of those of course going to the landfill. Um, so you know the kinds of connections we make and, I, and, and I'll just, uh, uh, I'll, I'll kind of come back to that picture there and what, what it, why it's up there. As Lynn pointed out, um, and as, again, all of you know, that there, there's, a, there's some amazing good news. Um, there are solutions to these problems. And I, again, I often tell people that it, there's, there's all of you, these thousands of people across the country, who've actually got the plans laid out. They've figured out what to do. They're starting to do it. Um, there's all kinds of great models. One of the reasons I wrote the book was to actually highlight those good news models to the, to the rank and file burger so they can actually look through there and see the kinds of great things that are happening. They're often, again, the things um, um, Lynn talked about. Um, they may be, you know, restoring salt marsh in Louisiana, not for the birds, but guess what? Model ducks like that habitat too. It turns out some of the biggest things for bird conservation aren't, aren't the things we think of as the traditional um, projects, but there are, there are lots of these kind of projects. Some of them are projects we're working on as well. And there's just, you know, a ton of them. We have to start making um, the public know that it's okay to say, you know what, we want more birds. We have the right to press for it. It's not, we don't have to be kind of uh, ashamed to say we want more birds. Uh, I think the duck community has been at the forefront of that, not being afraid to say, guess what, I want more ducks. But you know what, I, I want to have more warblers. I want more sparrows. I want more shorebirds. And I'm not afraid to say it. And we need to get out there and start saying it and get the public to say it. We've, again, we've heard um, from Lynn and others, you know, all these success stories. We've, when we figured out what the problem was, DDT, uh, whatever it was, we figured out how to solve it. We got the public involved and we fixed the problem. Um, you know, waterfowl, we, we figured out there was a problem, we galvanized people, we passed le various kinds of legislation to bring resources to the table, put coalition partners together, and we started solving the problem. It's not, it's not impossible. We have some amazing success in some of the boreal work that I'm doing. Um, we have what's probably the world's biggest conservation goal. We're trying to save 700 million acres, put 700 million acres into protected areas. I don't think uh, there's anywhere else in the world that's trying to do anything that big. Um, in 2007, we got 25 million acres protected, which we were pretty pleased about um, until last year when we uh, exceeded that and got the uh, uh, government of Ontario to promise to protect half of their intact boreal forest, 55 million acres. I can you imagine that in one fell swoop, 55 million acres protected. Um, and, and we actually think this is starting to leverage some of the other provinces in Canada to try to uh, match or even maybe try to do better, which is a great, you know, try to get them competing with each other to, to, uh, to, to, do, to do even more. So there's, there's, a, there's tons of great news out there. 
and it, it truly is, I, I think, the, the third great renaissance of bird conservation. Um, we've got all the pieces together, but what we have lacked is the public support, the kind of strong sub-public support we need. And I think there's some, some ways that all of us need to start thinking about how to, to connect that public support into what we're doing. Um, we need to think a little bit more about broader integration um, in partners, in across um, the types of projects, people we work with. Um, you know, before I started working on this Boreal campaign, I'd never really thought about, um, I mean, I, 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 I don't know if I even dare to say it here, working or having uh, um, communications with Greenpeace, Gulp, Forest Ethics. <clears throat> Guess what? Um, in many cases, they're the ones that are going to bring the partners to the table to sit down with, with all of us and actually move something. Label a lot of times, companies won't, won't come to the table unless they have a reason to. And in the case of the uh, the uh, the limited, the company that owns Victoria's Secret, um, an ad campaign that um, Forest Ethics and Greenpeace were involved in, which they they put a, a big full page ad with the the model with the chainsaw and it labeled Victoria's dirty little secret. Um, in the New York Times, we started going to shareholder meetings and doing some things to make make them want to come to the table. They they really weren't interested at all. But it took years of a couple of years of doing that, and they sat down and completely changed their buying practices. And when one company, that's the largest um, mail order company in the country, decides to start using recycled product or FSC certified product, that can change the entire landscape the business. So suddenly mills can retool. It's cost effective for them. Other partners can come along and start using FSC certified wood and, 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 and recycled product. I mean, it can change the entire of birds. That's a FSC certified product. That can change the entire landscape of the business. So suddenly mills can retool. It's cost effective for them. Other partners can come along and start using FSC certified wood and, and, and recycled product. I mean, it can change the entire face of, of the whole of, of conservation for for this region and you know and that affects millions of birds that's a huge impact